welcome. Um, I was hoping, Najma, if you could give me, give us the lay of the land uh, when it comes to different rules around AI, right? We're seeing lots of different uh, initiatives from the EU with the AI Act, but otherwise it seems like a wild west. Why is it so hard to come up with these rules and standards for AI? Sure. So first of all, thank you for having us uh, here and uh, having giving us the opportunity to present the work on AI and large language models that we're doing at the Technology Innovation uh, Institute. Um, so today the challenge, as you mentioned, is on the regulatory side and also on the technical side. So if we think about uh, regulations, um, the, the regulations um, it's, it's hard to put them because of the fast, of the racing, basically, AI system that we are seeing, especially on, in the context of uh, large language models. So the question becomes is, do you have a regulatory or a regulation or a regulatory framework that is one size fit all? Is it a risk-based regulation that looks at AI and then the different, let's say, um, safety concerns, security concerns, etc. Or do you have a modular regulatory framework that tries to adapt with the various, um, with, with basically the various evolutions of uh, of AI? So obviously, regulations today, if we think about it, it has to be inclusive. It has to be an effort that is being done between governmental bodies, between academic institutions, research institutions, as well as the different personas that are on the expertise side, so you know the experts that are developing those models that are looking at their um, evolution and in particular the use cases. So where are we going to apply them? Putting a regulation on AI that is going to be used in a gaming system is very different than putting the regulation on AI that is being to, that is going to be used in healthcare or in uh, life critical situations or other. Let alone that to put a generic framework doesn't work because even if I have have a system that has been certified or that has been you know deemed to be compliant with the regulatory framework in country one this will not be the same it will not have the same applicability in country two because of different um, data protection uh, laws because of different privacy preserving laws um, etc obviously on the technical side we can push all of this through the increased research and development activities but one thing that that is for sure very important is um, this has to be an inclusive effort and a collaborative effort as i said before between governments uh, and the various players having the right type of profiles um, in this collaborations and it has to be driven by large and powerful organizations by institutes that are at the governmental level for this to work just one point of mention is that the UAE has one of the first pioneers when it comes to this. It was one of the first countries that launched a ministry of artificial intelligence and uh, the minister, His Excellency Lalama, also heads what we call the AI Council, where you have various, the main uh, federal government entities that are there, they're looking at how do we apply artificial intelligence across various governmental services. At the same time, there is a group there that follows all the standards and regulations that are happening across the world and are trying to apply them at the level of the government. Great, thank you. Now, Hakim, AI uh, requires a lot of data. We need to hoover tons of it to build these models. And with open source, that data is is public. So how do you how do you take this how do you take privacy and data protection and sensitive data into account? How do you avoid that being hoovered into these massive open source models? Sure, thank you, Melissa. Uh, so the data is indeed a very core question whenever it comes to these LLMs, and we always somehow, we are always afraid of what we do with the data and what can be done with the, with the data. <clears throat> First thing that we need to understand is that as we are growing in our understanding of these models, we are also growing in our capability of manipulating in a better way this data. So this is a very important thing. So we have this aspect of uh, regulation, as Nedwa just mentioned, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. But while these regulations are put in place, we need to find a solution in between. Right? So the first thing that is done is, as I said, we are understanding better, we are doing a better cleaning of the data, we are removing all the sensitive data that we have inside, 
I think everybody remembers like eight months back when we use an LLM, we were also able to get some personal information on uh, individuals, the address, the email, the phone numbers, and this kind of things. I doubt that this is happening anymore in the current sort of uh, generations of LLM. So there is a progress in terms of understanding the data and manipulating the data. The second thing that we are trying to do and we are trying to push for is the transparency. So transparency comes from two perspectives, in my opinion. The first one is basically uh, sharing the data that we are using for the training. So this is what we have started to do. If you see, for example, for the Falcon model, the versions we had, the initial versions we had, we have open sourced the data. The refined web has been open sourced for the public. People, they can check what's inside. They can understand what type of data we have used for that. The second thing is that the model themselves are open source. So they are available for the community. They can check, they can look into whatever they, uh, whatever is happening as processes inside that black box. I think the third uh, pillar for this issue of data is to offer models that are able to run locally, to, to run on premise. So the models that are offered currently that, that are online, so basically you send your data and then you don't know what's happening with the data, right? So what we are trying to follow as a strategy is basically to have these models uh, powerful enough but able to run on premise so that you can have uh, a better sort of control of your data. Then we can think of other strategies actually when it comes to, for, for example, the encryption of data uh, and this kind of uh, techniques. These are very important, very interesting to explore. We are not using them currently because we, we have a big amount of compute that needs to be already like consumed. But these are tracks that we are also uh, looking into to even put the privacy and the security of data at the heart of our processes. Thank you. Now, Najwa, it, it sounds like there are tons of different initiatives, regulatory guidelines, standards, and yet AI is a global technology. How could we make this more of a cohesive approach, you know, for tech companies, a piecemeal approach is probably the worst case scenario. How can, yeah, how can we make this more of a global thing? Um, that's a very good question, and I think this, what, what Hakim said leads us into to you know this question of how can you make it as a collaborative effort how can you make it transformative by being inclusive to anybody so today at TII we're a very big advocate of open sourcing uh, large language models and we do believe this is a great platform for collaboration um, on the development of large language models on fine-tuning them as Hakim said on actually pruning them and having uh, them able to run on the edge on devices for various applications and we've demonstrated this uh, through the launch of uh, the series of the Falcon models which have been uh, leading globally uh, versus what exists in the market in terms of uh, large language models. We see this collaboration from a research perspective, but we do also encourage, um, you know, the, let's say, the contribution of how are we going to use them in uh, application, in critical applications, and those applications could even be um, life uh, critical. One important point, along with open sourcing the models, we are also open sourcing data sets. And this brings us also to the point of data federation. How can you safely and securely um, uh, basically share, share data? And Hakim touched upon multiple, let's say, privacy and security techniques that um, allow you to do that. So alongside open sourcing the models, one thing we're encouraging is looking into the AI safety, AI security. Today those models are opaque, right? So to transcend the opacity of those models, make them as transparent as possible, and then make them, let's say, as trustworthy as possible, there is a lot of collaboration that is needed. This is not an individual effort, this is a collaborative effort that we're hoping to address through the open source uh, philosophy or the open source um, 
um, uh, you know, framework that we're launching. And in order to encourage this more, back in February, using the World Government Summit, we have announced the uh, launch of the Falcon Foundation. And the Falcon Foundation has the same philosophy of encouraging collaboration from a research perspective uh, to uh, bring more uh, innovation and transformation in the world of large language model and generative AI um, in general. And we have committed to a $300 million fund in order to foster this uh, uh, innovation within the nonprofit foundation that we have launched. Okay, fantastic. Now I want to hear more about Falcon. So it's multilingual, multimodal, completely open source. So what makes it different or special and how does it compare to say GPT-4 or Gemini? Yeah, good. So indeed, so the second version Falcon 2 11b is multimodal and uh, multilingual indeed. So the important thing or focus that we put on the second generation of Falcon is the performance. I think uh, we are comparing to the uh, sort of the open source models that are there. It's pretty difficult to compare to models that are closed source uh, directly. So, but the performance uh, that we are having is very similar to uh, what Gemma is having, Gemma 7b, and we are out outperforming the, the uh, Llama 8. Uh, so, in terms of uh, interest that we are getting, most probably, most of the time, we think of the financial interest, right? So, uh, we are opening, uh, we are open sourcing these kind of models actually to bring the community to work together. So that's our contribution to the community. Uh, we believe that AI is a pretty big topic to be handled only by one team or one institute. So, we are putting this effort to open source so that we provide the community a tool or a way to, to work on, on something that is already ready and then to take it further to build a, a sort of a better understanding on better, better tools uh, for AI. The second thing that we are providing is this uh, aspect of compute that is missing for uh, most of the people currently who are working on the AI. So we provide the model, we provide the data, we provide also compute for people to uh, incrementally improve the performance and reach at some point, hopefully, the performance of these models uh, that are currently uh, pretty close to us. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one audience question. Any questions about open source? Anything? All right. You've been a pretty thorough. Well, I have a question uh, for you, Najwa. Um, what is next? What sort of, what can we expect and what kind of key breakthroughs can can we see if you had a crystal ball or anything? Tell us what's next. So maybe starting from Falcon and and moving into the whole let's say uh, scene of uh, generative AI. Obviously, as you've seen through the various launch that Hakim mentioned, from Falcon 40B to 180B to the multimodality that has been increased, there is a there is a path of innovation that is being brought through those open source models that uh, we are uh, we are launching. Um, as we move forward, the accuracy, the efficiency, um, the the performance uh, would be definitely improved. There is continuous R and D effort within the AI team at TII that Hakim is leading, where we're looking into new architectures, where we're looking into how can we fine tune those models, how can we make those models from being, you know, the large models that have to be centralized into models that can be deployed on premise on in models that can be deployed on the edge uh, devices as well. If you, as you can imagine, uh, depending on you know this uh, efficiency, let's say the model can be used in order to be used for robotics, for example, for manipulation arms in the healthcare sector. There is myriad of applications that we can think of. And we're hoping that also through this work that we are leading, you know, in generative AI, we, we will get much closer to, to reasoning, right? And we will we will get much closer into getting into into models that um, 
you know that will get you closer to the general intelligence that we're all uh, we're we're all looking for. So yeah, I would say this is this is the path. But definitely, as we're launching new models, we're trying to innovate. We're trying to improve the model um, efficiency, accuracy, the architecture, and in particular, tailor it and make it suitable for various applications. Because at the end, we're doing those large large language models to be applicable and to to uh, to provide societal good. We are in AI for good today, so this is the ultimate aim that we have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, folks. That's all we have time for. Thank you.